Our sermon this week is taken from Mark 2, 1 verse 12. Let's read together on the count of three. One, two, three. And when he returned to Capernaum, after some days, it was reported to them at home, and many were gathered together, so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them, and they came, bringing Hitton, a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near them because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. He, saw the par- he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of those lives were saying, <laughs> questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can give sons but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, Say to you, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. This is the word of the Lord. Awesome, guys. You guys may be seated. Well, so good to see Jackie reading the scriptures. Kind of be a sweet moment, right? I mean, it's sweet, the fact that we have the youngest member actually read the scripture. Bitter, because it reminded me that I'm quite old. I share pulpit with Jacqueline Susatio. Wow. Anyway, Merry Christmas. Um, I know these sermons, I mean, the passage doesn't sound like a Christmas sermon, but kind of, a little bit. Okay. Let me start with a question. What is the best gift you received this Christmas? Okay. Anyone receive a new laptop? New computer, new TV, new iPad, new handbag. You guys don't get anything from Christmas? No gift whatsoever, I think. I think if some of us, I think we, we, can be, we can share. Definitely we receive something for Christmas, right? I mean, for some of us it might be new handbag, new car, if you're rich enough, or new house. Or for some of us, it might be a new relationship. For some of us, it might be for the first time we actually have a ring on our finger this Christmas season, right? And for the singles, let me give you a heads up. I heard, this is what I heard, you know, I haven't tried, but I heard that Christmas season is the perfect season to ask someone out. Why? Because there's a high chance the other person say yes, because they do not want to be alone during this season. But singles, it's too late for you now. Give it a try next year. Not you, Jackie, you're too young. But for others, for some of us, it's maybe, maybe, maybe the best Christmas gift we receive, it's, it's that gift, you know, it's that suit that you buy for yourself as a present because you know no one else would get it for you, right? So whatever it is, I mean, we might have a different definition of what is the best gift we receive this Christmas, but here's what I know about your best gift. The best gift is always related to our perceived need. You want me, you with me on that? So if your need, if the thing that you really want and you need is a new laptop, Receiving a new Nespresso machine is great. It's awesome, but it's not the best gift. What is the best gift for you? A new laptop, right? So and today when we talk about the greatest gift, the question is what is the greatest gift that you and I can ever receive? Well, it depends. It depends on what we think is our greatest need. If we think that our greatest need in life is for us to be happy, then the greatest gift will be whatever can make us happiest. You with me on that? So if your greatest need in life is for you to be successful, then the greatest gift that you can ever receive is whatever can guarantee our success. The greatest gift is always, always related to greatest need. But when it comes to the gospel, when it comes to our need, the gospel is very counterintuitive. Because this is what the gospel tells us. The gospel tells us that we have a need that we don't even know we have. And that need is our greatest need. And until that need is met, 
all other gifts are useless. And the good news of Christmas is that Jesus has come to give us the greatest gift. So as we continue a, a series on the book of Mark, throughout this book of Mark, we've been asking the question is, who actually Jesus is? I mean, because that's what we want to know, right? We want to know who Jesus is. Because we've been saying again and again that the Jesus of our own imagination, that Jesus is useless. That Jesus cannot meet our greatest need. So in Mark chapter 1, we learn that Jesus, in fact, is a king. But he's a king unlike any other king in this world. And his kingdom is very different from the kingdom of this world. And this king, he has authority over diseases and demons. And wherever he goes, he casts out demons and heals the sick. To the point that right now, at this time, people are amazed at Jesus. And so far in the story, at least, everyone, everyone's happy with Jesus. Everywhere Jesus goes, people praises God because amazing things happen. But, here's the big but, in Mark chapter 2, it starts to change. Because starting in this chapter, Mark will show us what happened when Jesus goes public. Here's what happened. Jesus confronts the custom and the tradition of his day. And when he does that, some people begin to feel uncomfortable around Jesus. Some people are shocked. And some are furious with Jesus. Okay, and in this passage, once again, we find what is actually the priority of Jesus. And his priority is very different from our priority. Because we tend to focus on what's important here and now. But Jesus is far more interested in our greatest need. And we will see that Jesus always prioritized the eternal over the temporary. And I'm pretty sure if you grew up in church, you are very familiar with this story, okay? So let's look at this story together, and I separate this sermon into three parts. The faith, the need, and the authority. Let's go to the first one. The faith, first one to four. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at a home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. So at the end of the sermon last week, we, we mentioned how Jesus actually had to leave Capernaum and go to the other town to preach the gospel. Remember that? But now, after some days, what happens? Jesus returned to Capernaum, and he returns home. Now, the home here most likely is not Jesus' home. It is most likely Peter's home, okay? Remember when Jesus stayed at Peter's house and heals Peter's, Peter's mother-in-law? So now, Jesus returned to stay back in, in Peter's house. And the news that Jesus returns home travels super fast. So to the point that finally the crowd gathered together in front of Peter's house. And Jesus is so popular at this point, to the point that the house is extremely packed. There's no room whatsoever for people to walk in and walk out. So Jesus is like celebrated of his day. But think about it. Do you think that everyone is there for the right reason? I don't think so. I am sure there's many people there because they want something from Jesus. Because they heard that Jesus is able to heal the sick. So they gathered there because why? Because they want healing. And some people are simply there because they want to check out the hype, right? Whenever you see some crowd, you're like, ooh, what's happening? And you just want to join in. So a lot of people are there with the wrong motivation. And this is what's interesting about the book of Mark. Mark never, never uh, equate the crowd with believers. It is never mentioned in the gospel of Mark that the crowd actually believe and repent. There's none. There's no record whatsoever which teach us a very important lesson. Here's what we must get. Proximity to Jesus is not the same as faith in Jesus. It is very possible to be drawn to Jesus, to be amazed at Jesus, to admire Jesus, and never put faith in Jesus. But you know what Jesus does? This was amazing. Jesus preached the gospel to them. And this is just Jesus' main priority. We see it last week. Wherever the crowd gathers, rather than giving the crowd what they want, Jesus will actually first and foremost preach the gospel. 
Because Jesus want to point out to you and me that, listen crowd, you have a need that you don't even know you have, and I am here to answer that need. And Jesus' priority is always to preach the gospel. And if Jesus' priority is to preach the gospel to the crowd, then the church priority must always to preach the gospel. You with me on that? Okay, so let's get into the story. So what happened is this. So while Jesus preached the gospel, what happened is four men show up with a paralyzed man on a mat. So these four men want to get their paralytic friend to Jesus. Now we're not told what happened to this paralyzed man, okay? Was he born this way? Was that a tragic event? Was it because of sin? We're not told. But these four men know something. If only, listen, if only they can get their friend to Jesus, if only their friend can meet Jesus, then they sure, Jesus will heal their friend. But it's the problem. There is no way they can get through the front door. Why? Because the house is extremely packed. So no one will let them in. So I want you to imagine the conversation between these four men. It's not written in the Bible, but imagine that. So the first man says this, well, I have an idea. Since we can't enter to the front door, here's what we do. Why don't we climb up on the roof? And the second man responds, come on, what good that will do? Jesus is inside the house, not outside. Duh. And the first reply, well, yeah, I'm not dumb, but we can take the roof off. And the third comment, what kind of people take another people's roof off? I mean, Peter will be mad at us. And the first person again say, I think it's worth a try. I mean, we can apologize later and fix the roof. And finally, the fourth person say, you know what? That's the only option we have. We must get our friend to Jesus. Do or die. Let's do it. So they climb up on the roof, tear down the roof, and let down their friend from the roof. And Mark writes, it is crucial, Mark writes that when Jesus see what the man does, what the man do, Jesus see, you know what Jesus see? Faith. Don't miss this, because this is the first time the word faith is used in the book of Mark. And when Mark describes faith, Mark is not talking about intellectual knowledge about Jesus, oh no. He's talking about active trust in Jesus. Because we know nothing about what these four men believe except for their action. And their actions show their faith. And I think there's six characteristics of faith that we can see from this man. First, six characteristics of faith. First, their faith is confident. Do you see, the, do you see what happened there? Because this man, if they're not confident that Jesus actually would heal the person and could heal the person, they will not go to such extent. But the fact that they're willing to go to such extent is because they believe if only they can get their friend in front of Jesus, then amazing thing will happen. They're confident. And the second thing is this, they're persistent. I mean, they don't give up easily. When they can't enter the house because of the crowd, they don't say, well, mate, tough luck, right? I mean, we tried, but there's no way. Too bad there are too many people. Maybe it's just not meant to be. Tough luck. They didn't do that. You know what they do? They think outside the box. They know that their friend has a need that only Jesus can meet, and they will not stop until their friend meet Jesus. And third, I think their faith is very creative. Would you agree with me? I mean, there's obstacle run the way, but they will not let the crowd nor the roof get in the way. They think outside of the box. And I'm sure if you're part of the crowd, when you see what they do, you will be thinking, dude, why did I think of that? Right? They're creative. And fourth, their faith is compassionate. Because these four men actually genuinely love their friend. Because if you know anything about paralytic, paralytic cannot move. Paralytic cannot do anything. All he can do is lay on his bed. He's at the mercy of people around him. He's helpless. But then his friends come and said, you know what? We're not going to leave you on your own. There is hope for you. They love their friend. And faith, their faith is sacrificial. Now I am sure, I am sure there are many judging eyes and words directed at their action. 
imagine Peter, the owner of the house, as he sees this man take out his roof. Dude, that's my roof. I mean, you better fix it later, or I will cut your ear mess with my sword, right? And remember Peter's mother-in-law, who, will, who had fever in the past and was killed by Jesus? When she witnessed what happened, she probably have another fever, and Jesus will have to heal her again. But these men ignore all the protests, ignore all the judgment. They know that we'll have to fix the roof later, but they say it's a price that's worthy to be paid. They think it's worth it. And six, their faith is contagious. Now, David Platt makes this very interesting observation. He says this, I mean, we do not know about the fate of the paralytic man. I mean, we don't know much about him, but imagine if you are that man. So you hear word about Jesus being able to heal all kinds of diseases. And you hear that Jesus is in town, Jesus in Peter's house, and everybody around you rush to get to Peter's house to see Jesus. But here you are, stuck. Nothing you can do. There's no hope whatsoever. Until your friend comes to you and says, you know what, we are going to take you to Jesus because we believe Jesus can heal you. How would you feel? You will be encouraged by their faith. You start to have hope. Yes, maybe, just maybe this guy, this Jesus can heal me. Just maybe he actually will heal me. But then as you get to in front of the house, you find out that there's so many people and you can't get into the house no matter what you try. What do you feel now? Discourage. But then you look at your friends, they're talking with one another, and they have this crazy idea about getting up on the roof, removing the roof, and letting you down through the roof. And you're like, dude, that's crazy. But your friends are crazy enough to do it. And now your faith is encouraged. You're like, oh, maybe, maybe, they just maybe, maybe I could actually meet Jesus. Then your friends take you to the roof, strap ropes to your mat, and their face are filled with expectation that something amazing is about to happen. And looking at their face glimmering with expectation, your heart is filled with hopeful anticipation. So your friend lowers you from the roof, and your mat finally hits the floor. You are finally in the presence of Jesus. So now, as you look at the face of Jesus, and you look at in the background the faces of your friend, like they're like, yeah, all right, come on, this is it. So what happened to you? Your heart right now is filled with faith. Why? Because the faith of these four men are contagious and affected Jesus and the paralyzed man. Here's my point. These men believe in Jesus and will do whatever they take, whatever it takes to bring their friend to Jesus. It is a powerful reminder for all of us. What is it? If we believe that Jesus is the only one who can meet people's greatest need, then we should do whatever it takes to bring people around us to Jesus. It might be our family, our friends, our co-workers, our neighbors. What they need is to encounter Jesus for themselves. And if that's true, that means we should do whatever we can to make it happen. And it's not going to be easy. It's going to be filled with many challenges and obstacles in sharing the gospel with them. But our faith should be confident, persistent, creative, sacrificial, compassionate, and contagious. Believing that God can save them and God will save them. We should never, ever give up on anyone's salvation. Keep sowing the gospel, persevere in sharing the gospel, and see how God will respond to our faith. Okay? And look at what happened next. It's beautiful. At the same time, it is very confusing. Look at the need. Second point. Verse 5. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Hold on a second. Now, do you see what's confusing about this? If I was part of the crowd, I'd be like, wait, hold on a second. Jesus are you the only one who did not get the memo? I mean, can't you see what is happening, Jesus? I think you're missing the point. Well, first of all, let me say that it's very nice of you to forgive this man of his sin. 
I think that's cute, Jesus. There's a few problems with your claim, but let's save it for the later part of the sermon. But I think it's obvious that this man, what this man needs is not forgiveness of sin. I mean, James, 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 James. Can you see what this man need? Yeah. Peter, can you see what this man need? Yeah. John, yes. Jesus, everybody can see it, but you. What this man need is not forgiveness of sin, even though it's cute. What this man need is actually healing. His friend went to that extreme length, not for forgiveness, but for healing. Let me put it this way. Imagine if you have a toothache and you go to a dentist to get it fixed. And your dentist check on you and say, oh, I can see the problem. You need a root canal treatment. So here's the fix. Your sins are forgiven. Goodbye. You'll be like, doesn't make any sense. You crazy. It's confusing. What is happening here? Let me tell you what is happening. Because everybody in the room thinks that this man's greatest need is for him to be able to walk again. But Jesus says to the man, listen, you think you know what is your greatest need. You think that the main problem in your life is you are not able to walk. But let me tell you, that is not the problem. Yes, I can see that you're suffering. Yes, I can see that you're in so much pain. And I'm going to do about it, something about it soon. But you first need to realize that the main problem in your life is not that you're paralytic. The main problem in life is that you are a sinner. And what you need the most is not healing, but forgiveness of sin. And this is radical. In other words, this is what happened in the story. Jesus looked beyond the paralytic immediate need to his greatest need. And Jesus wants to give this man the greatest gift that he does not even know that he needs. Because it does not matter how bad a physical paralysis is, it cannot be compared to spiritual paralysis. This man probably thinks the same like you and me, right? If only I can walk again, then I'll be all right. If only I can walk again, then I will be happy. If, I can only, if only I can walk again, then I will be a better person. And Jesus tells this person, no, you're mistaken. Because if I only heal you, Yes, you might be happy for the next three months, but you'll be sad again because you will be broken again. Because the root of your problem is not your disease. The root of your problem is your sin. And I believe Jesus is say, saying the same to all of us today. Jesus is saying to us, if we come to him simply for him to meet our physical needs, we are not going deep enough. If we look to him simply to answer our immediate needs, we're only looking at the service problem. Because the problem is that often time, we don't even know what our greatest need is. We focus so much on the, our immediate needs, on the here and now, but Jesus looked differently. Jesus wants us to focus on the greatest need. See, when we come to Jesus, we often say this, right? Jesus, if only you give me that job. Jesus, if you only bless me at work. Jesus, if you only bless me financially. Jesus, if you only allow me to get to that school. Jesus, if only you change my parents' heart. Jesus, if only you give me the perfect spouse. Jesus, if only you give me that children. If only, if only, if only, if only. And Jesus say, if I give you what you ask, it will not solve anything. If I give you that healing, you will get sick again. If I give you that financial breakthrough, of course, you'll be happy for the next couple of weeks, months. You'll be able to shop. But after that, you will soon realize that that money is nothing but emptiness. Because your greatest problem is not lack of money. Your greatest problem is here, that you built your identity on something else beside me. And until you have me, the problem will not be solved. That is why the best thing that I can tell you, the best thing that I can do for you is forgiving you of your sin. Why? Because in forgiving you of your sin, I actually give what your heart most desire, a relationship with the Creator, a relationship with me. And in order for you to have a relationship with me, you first need to be forgiven of your sin. Now, can you see what happened in the story? That's why it's confusing. And I love the way Warren Wispy put it. He put it this way. 
Forgiveness is the greatest miracle Jesus ever performed. It meets the greatest need. It costs the greatest price. And it brings the greatest blessing and the most lasting result. But now I want, you, I want you to pay attention to the heart of Jesus. This was an, a very, very amazing about the heart of our Savior. I want you to feel the gentleness of his heart. Because the paralytic man do not come to Jesus seeking to be safe. He come to Jesus seeking a healer, not a savior. He asked Jesus to meet his immediate need, not his greatest need. When he come to Jesus, you know what Jesus gave? Rather than just simply get answering and giving this man the immediate need, Jesus gave him what he actually need. And here's what we must get about Jesus. When we come to Jesus, Jesus will not give us what we think we need, but he will give us what we truly need. And when he gave it to us, it's not simply because we deserve it. Because remember, the paralytic man do not even seek Jesus us to be saved. When Jesus actually gave what this man actually need, he does it out of grace. He does it out of us in own willingness. To the point that Jesus is so gracious, to the point that when this man come to Jesus, his faith is imperfect. His faith is filled with flaw. But what Jesus does is he sees that weak faith, that flaw faith, and he answers and he grants forgiveness for it. I mean, Jesus is so eager to express love and forgiveness to us that he does not even wait for us to have it all right. Jesus' grace and forgiveness invade our heart through the smallest opening that we have. Here's the good news. We don't even have to say the magic word. We don't even have to say the right word before he does something for us. A couple of days ago, I watched what I consider the best superhero movie of all time, the new Spider-Man. Now, in this movie, there's a scene, okay, before you throw a stone at me, okay, before you actually try to kill me, my brother Nate says, if the scene is included in the trailer, it is not a spoiler, okay? So if you still want to throw stones, aim toward the back of the room, not the pulpit. So there's this scene where Doctor Strange asks Spider-Man and his friend to do something for him. And then MJ replied, well, I know a couple of magic words myself, starting with the word, please. Okay, this is, this is what we do when our sibling asks us to do something, right? What is the magic word? Please. But when we look at Jesus, Jesus do not do that. Jesus does not ask, no need us to say the magic word. But rather what happened with Jesus, Jesus is like the prodigal, the father in the prodigal son. If you remember what happened, the son betrayed the father, takes his inheritance and walk away from the family. And when the son realizes his mistake and come home, you know what the father does? Rather than waiting for his son to come to him, when the father sees the son from afar, the father runs to the son, hugs the son, and kiss the son. Not because the son said the right word. The son does not even have the chance to say anything yet. And here's something that we need to understand about Jesus. The only reason we can repent and receive forgiveness of sin is because Jesus right now today is pursuing us with grace and love. This is the heart of Jesus. Listen, I do not know why, why you're tuning in to this service today. Why are you here today? But I do know many of us might come with a wrong motivation. But the good news of the gospel is Jesus is not turned off by it. But rather, Jesus is pursuing you aggressively with his grace. The reason you are here, the reason, the reason you are listening to the sermon is because the good news is Jesus is pursuing after your heart. And he will not give up until you can see that your greatest need is forgiveness and that he has the best ever gift available for you and me. So let's continue with the story. My third point, the authority. Verse 6 and 7. Now some of the scribes were sitting there, questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? 
So now the scene changes. If before the scene focused on the paralytic, now the scene changes from the paralytic to the scribe. And this actually marked the beginning of Jesus' confrontation with the religious leaders. So who are the scribes? The scribes are the experts of the law of Moses. They are highly respected by people around them. So by this time, everybody heard of Jesus, and the scribes have heard of this miracle worker by the name of Jesus. So they heard how Jesus healed the sick, cast out demons, and they heard how people compared Jesus' teaching with their teaching. So some of them decided, you know what, let's check this dude out. So they come to Peter's house to listen to Jesus to investigate on this new uprising star. But they're extremely shocked. They are extremely shocked when they hear Jesus say what? Your sins are forgiven. They immediately say in their heart, hold on a second. That is not right. I mean, did we hear him right? Because only God has the right to forgive sin. I mean, not even the promised Messiah can do it. No one can forgive sins but God. And for him to say that, that's a blasphemy. And the consequences of blaspheming is that Jesus must die. And it's not wrong for them to think like that. Because the Old Testament is clear that the forgiveness of sin is the exclusive right of God. God is the one who's offended at every sin. For example, David writes in Psalm 51 verse 4, this is what he says, Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. This is David responding to God's rebuke of his sin. You remember what happened? David slept with another man's wife. David killed the man, and David tried to cover up. And now, when David prayed to God, David said, Against you and you only have I sinned. With another word, David no under something, understands something about the Old Testament. That's this. That every sin, first and foremost, is against God. When you commit sins, whatever sin that is, you break the commandment of God. And that means you commit reason against God. And only God has the right to forgive sin. So for Jesus to say, that he forgives sin. You know what he's saying? Jesus, with another word, Jesus saying that you are sinning against me. And the scribes think, hold on a second, Jesus, you have no rights to say that because it does not involve you. Let me put it this way. Let's say on your way to church, like your husband and wife, let's say on your way to church, you had a big fight in the car, right? So your spouse said some, some of the meanest thing, the rudest words, the rudest, rudest words that anyone has ever said to you. So when you come to church, you are angry and you are furious and you are hurt. You don't want to come to church, but you have to because you are scheduled for ministry. And you think that your spouse is such a hypocrite to be able to minister after all the terrible thing that he or she said to you in the car. But of course, when you got to church and the usher greet you, say, ho, 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 Merry Christmas, how are you? You reply, I am blessed and highly favored. But deep inside, you know, you just cannot wait for the church to be over so that you can tear your spouse to pieces. And then after church, I walk up to you and your spouse, and then I say to your spouse, listen, I know you guys had a big fight on the way to church. I know what you said to your spouse. And I just want you to know that I have forgiven you. You don't have to worry about it anymore. At this time, what would you do to me? You probably want to tear me to pieces as well, right? You will say to me, I know you're my pastor, but who do you think you are? This has nothing to do with you. This is between me and my wife or my husband. I am the one who sinned against. You cannot forgive something that is not done to you. Now, can you see what happened? And this is exactly what this, why the scribe was very angry. Because they understand the significance of what Jesus has just said. In forgiving sin, Jesus is claiming, I am God. And we must get this, because every now and then, there are some professors of experts who say that Jesus never really claimed that he's God. 
They say that it was a myth that Jesus' disciples invented to get people to worship Jesus. Jesus himself never thought of himself as a God. But they're wrong. The scribes get it right. But the scribes also get it very wrong. Because they say it is a blasphemy for Jesus to say that. And the punishment for blasphemy is that. It is certainly a blasphemy for a mere man to claim that he can forgive sin. But what they do not know is Jesus is not a mere man. Jesus is God who took on flesh. And so that means we only have two choices regarding to Jesus. Only two. Either Jesus is God or he's a blasphemer. There's no middle ground. The scribe understand this, okay? And that is why. Look at what happened next. Verse 8 to 11. And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus question within themselves, said to them, Why do you question this thing in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sin, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. Now, can you imagine the surprise on the scribes' faces when Jesus called out to them? I mean, because Jesus actually read what happened in their heart. And this is another hint of Jesus' divinity. And Jesus asked them this profound, profound question. He asked this. Listen. Which is easier? To say to the paralytic man that his sin is forgiven, or to say to him, get up and walk? No, I think, I think from our perspective, it's clear, right, which one is easier. It's a lot easier to say to a paralytic, your sins are forgiven, than saying, get up and walk. Why? Imagine. If there's a paralytic person in this place, and I say, your sins are forgiven, what happened? No one can tell, right? If nothing happens, he's like, yep, you just believe it by faith, your sins are forgiven. But if I say to a paralytic man in this place, get up and walk, and nothing happened, what happened? Cuckoo, 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 right? Everybody like, he's claiming something that he clearly do not have. He's claiming to have the power that he has no power whatsoever. So we will be easily able to tell whether I have the power to forgive sin, whether I have the power to do it or not, by what I say. So pay attention to Jesus' logic. So Jesus' logic goes like this. We know that only God can forgive sin. And we also know that only God can make a paralytic walk. So if Jesus can say to the paralytic, get up and walk, and it happened, then it's safe to say that Jesus can also say to the public man, your sins are forgiven, and it happened. If Jesus has the authority of God to do what we can see with our eyes, we can trust that Jesus also has the authority of God to do what we cannot see with our eyes. Now, do you follow Jesus' logic? And to show us and all of the scribes that Jesus has the authority on earth to forgive him sins. Jesus said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And look at verse 12. Beautiful. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying what? We never saw anything like this. Now, do you see the point of the story now? Do you see why this must happen? Because remember, the scribe asked the question, who can forgive sin but God alone? And Jesus replied with exclamation mark, I can. By healing the paralytic, Jesus showed his authority to do what only God can do. If God alone can forgive sin and make a paralytic walk, then Jesus must be God incarnate. In here, Jesus gives us undeniable evidence to describe and to the crowd that Jesus is God. 
the healing of the paralytic only proof that Jesus can forgive sin. And when the crowd witnessed what happened, here's what the crowd say, Oh my Lord, we have never seen anything like this. And they all miss and glorify God. Now imagine that scene with me for a second. So the paralytic man, you know, in front of your eyes, he was lame before, but now he's walking, he's jumping, he's praising God. And then look at their friends. Their friends are up in the roof, high-fiving, chest bumping, taking a selfie most likely. The crowd are amazed. The scribes are frustrated and frowning. But no one can deny, at this time, no one can deny that the paralytic has been healed and his sins are forgiven. They may not like it, but they cannot deny it. There's no doubt anymore. Jesus is not merely a teacher with authority. Jesus is not merely a miracle worker. Jesus is God incarnate, and he has all the power and authority. And with the birth of Jesus, this is what happened. The kingdom of God has come near. Restoration of this broken world has begun. The true king has come to bring forgiveness, healing, salvation, and restoration. And the good news of Christmas is there's no enemy he cannot defeat. There's no need he cannot meet. There's no pain he cannot comfort. There's no problem he cannot solve. There's no sickness he cannot heal. There's no sin he cannot forgive. Why? Because the God of the universe has come to us in the person of Jesus, and he has come to give us the greatest gift. Jesus has come to meet our greatest need. Jesus has come to forgive us of our sins once and for all. And my friend, this is the true meaning of Christmas. And if you understand this, that is why we can sing the Christmas song that we know, Gloria in ex Celsius Deo. Glory to God in the highest. Let me close with this. So let's go back to the profound question that Jesus asked. Because this is one of the questions that continue to be debated years after Jesus' death. And that question is this. Which is easier? To say to a paralytic man that his sin is forgiven or to say to him, get up and walk? This is a profound question because there's more than one answer. From our perspective, it is clear, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven. But listen, from Jesus' perspective, it is infinitely harder to forgive sin than to make paralytic walk. Think about it. Jesus can heal paralytic with the snap of his finger. Like that, just like that. Because he is the creator of the universe. He has all the power and the authority. It does not cost him anything to heal paralytic men. But to forgive sin, it costs Jesus everything. Do you know what the price for Jesus to say that your sins are forgiven? Do you know what's the price for it? Death on the cross. Because Jesus knew exactly, if he healed this paralytic man and said that his sins are forgiven, he knew exactly the religious leaders are watching him and they are going to kill him. So when Jesus makes this declaration, your sins are forgiven, this is Jesus' first step toward the path of death. He could have avoided, but Jesus chose to heal the paralytic man and forgive him of his sin. Because Jesus understands something that we understand. If Jesus only heals the man and never forgive him of his sin, it's only a matter of time before he becomes paralyzed again. It's only a matter of time. And the only way to make a paralytic walk and dance forever is for Jesus to have his leg nailed to the cross. The price for the forgiveness of sin is the life of the king of life. And in doing so, Jesus is pointing out our greatest need, and he answered at the same time. Our greatest need in life is to be forgiven, to be, to be forgiven of our sin. And Jesus has come to give us the greatest gift. He says to us, if you come to me, your sins are forgiven. And when you experience that forgiveness from God, it's what happened. It changes the desire of our heart. 
So we no longer come to God and say, Lord, if only I have this. Lord, if only I have that. But rather we say this, I have never seen anything like this. And we glorify God. And let me close with this great quote from C.S. Lewis. It's quite long, but let me read it to you. A man who has merely a man and said the sort of thing Jesus said will not be a great moral teacher. He will either be a lunatic on a level with the man who says he's a poached egg, or else he will be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shop him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. You only, we only have two choices. Either Jesus is God or he's a lunatic. He's a blasphemer. And if he's God, he has the authority to forgive you of your sin. And the question that we must answer is this. Has Jesus forgiven you of your sin? Because if not, there's an invitation from him to receive forgiveness of sin. And this is the greatest gift anyone could ever receive. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that Christmas in this wonderful time of the year, you show us the cost, the price that you're willing to pay in order to answer our greatest need. In giving us your son, Jesus Christ, you give us the greatest gift of Christmas. And that is you. And Lord, for the time again and again, Lord, that we forgot about this, or maybe we look to other things beside you to satisfy us, forgive us, Lord. But remind us today, Lord, that you are what we need the most. The relationship with you is actually the only thing that can satisfy our longing soul. And in order for us to have that, you must first forgive us of our sin. So we thank you, Lord, for not holding back on us. We thank you, Lord, even when we come to you with weak faith, weak, crumble faith, you take that small space. You invade us with your goodness and grace and you forgive us of our sin. So help us, Lord. If there's any of us, Lord, who listen to this sermon and any of us in this place who have yet to come to you and ask for forgiveness of sin, I pray that today we come to you and we humbly say, Lord, we need you to forgive us of our sin. And we will hear you clearly say to us that our sins have been forgiven. So we receive this greatest gift in this Christmas day. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Let's stand to our feet as we sing.